Are there any matters before the jury comes in? Maybe three more minutes, we might be able to. Three more minutes, okay. Yes. I'll sit right here. All right, great. Thank you. Thank you. I think we did figure out, we came to an agreement for um, the crime scene photos that I originally had filed a motion objecting to being introduced. Okay. Um, so I will withdraw that part of my motion. Um, I still have a, a separate pending issue when the pathologist testifies, um, but we have agreed on a few photographs. Um, so I will withdraw, withdraw the crime okay. scene. If you'll uh, let me know the exhibit numbers that you're all agreeing to. It's exhibit number three, the closing picture on Was that correct, Ms. Pinnock? Yes, Your Honor. These exhibits are admitted into evidence by stipulation of the parties. Thank you, Your Honor. Subject to the proper foundation being laid. You can bring the jury.
Okay, thank you. You may call your next witness. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court. The state calls Lieutenant Todd Schenck. Thank you. Todd Shank. Lieutenant Shank, good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. <clears throat> Tell this jury where you're employed. I'm currently employed with the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division, also known as SLED. What is your role with SLED? So right now I'm the, the lieutenant of the Crime Scene Investigations Unit. How long have you been in that capacity? I've been in the Crime Scene Investigations Unit for a little over seven and a half years now. All right. And how long have you been in law enforcement altogether? A little over seven and a half years. Okay. You spent your entire career there? Yes, sir. All right. And so when you talk about working in a crime scene, what does that mean? So the job or the role of the crime scene department is with SLED, we're an assisting agency. So when a local agency calls for help, specifically with homicides or major cases, the crime scene unit will respond and provide forensics expertise with collecting of evidence, documenting the scene, writing reports, so that we can provide a uh, forensic investigation to the local agency that may not have the ability to do a crime scene investigation of their own. So for those that may not be familiar, when you use words like forensic, can you describe what that means? Yes, so we're not doing interviews with suspects. We're not, you know, we're not the normal investigators you see on TV in the sense of going and knocking on doors. Our job is to respond to the actual incident location or follow on locations. And our job is taking pictures, looking at the evidence, collecting the proper evidence or collecting evidence that we believe might be pertinent to the case and trying to figure out what happened during the crime scene and make sure we document everything we can to provide more information as to what happened during the scene. So forensics is more along the lines of the science role of the investigation. What kind of training do you have in order to carry out this task? So at SLED, we have an in-house training. We also go to external training, but the in-house training consists of, we call them blocks, they're, they're more sections. So photography, DNA collection, evidence collection in general, how to write reports, how to maintain case records, how to document footwear and tire tread impressions. And while you're going through these training blocks, you have to read books and articles, which then you're tested on where you have to take a written test. And then you also have to take a practical examination to show that you're competent in doing such skill. At the end of that training, we have an all-encompassing written test where you have to take the test and pass. After that, you also have, a, we call it a mock crime scene. Imagine a pretend crime scene where you have to prove that you know how to follow policies, or policies and procedures, and you have to be able to successfully complete a crime scene investigation for the mock scene. And we also have a mock court where we have to show that we have the ability to testify. Once all that's completed, you're deemed competent in crime scene investigation. And besides the in-house training, I've also been through uh, external photography training, a blood stain pattern analysis training, a shooting reconstruction training. If you had to approximate how many crime scenes do you think you've responded to over your seven and a half years? I think last time I checked it was about 413. Right. Is that confined solely to the Midlands here? No, sir. We respond to the whole state from coast to Georgia. We go everywhere. Okay. When you respond to a crime scene, what is your goal? What is your intention when you get there? What are you trying to do? So when we first get to the scene, we try to gather as much information as possible. Sometimes we get a decent amount of information, sometimes we, we have none. And the job, our, our job is to try to document the scene as, and preserve the evidence as best as we can. So our first photographs are documenting exactly what we see, where it's at, how the condition of the area or the evidence that exists in the scene. And we're just trying to preserve and show exactly what was going on during the crime scene or as, it, as we got there, what, what existed and where it was. So do you say as you got there, um, on occasion have crime scenes, have people 
present or walking or driving through and things like that prior to your arrival? Yes, we, sometimes we get it where folks have moved things or touched things or vehicles have driven through the crime scene. Um, it, sometimes it's pristine, it just depends on the situation. Okay, and um, as a result, if you know that there has been foot traffic or car traffic uh, in a crime scene, does that impact the manner in which you look for certain evidence? It, it can. Um, if, for instance, in this case, there's a dirt road and a former access road that was also dirt, and we were advised that multiple vehicles had been traveling on this dirt road. So that kind of excludes any other vehicle or tire track impressions that we would really look for because theoretically they've been contaminated because people driving up and down the road. So th that would be an instance. And that's a judgment call that, that you have to make as the investigator on the scene, correct? That's correct. So let's turn to the case at hand. Um, I want to take you back to March 29th of 2019. Did you receive a call to respond to Clarendon County? We did. And when you say we, who are you referring to? My partner at the time, Delilah, uh, Cic Cicerone, her last name was Jazik, so if I refer to that, it, she got married. But um, So myself and Special Agent Cicerone. Cicerone. Also, she is also a uh, crime scene investigator? She is. Okay. Why are there two of you responding? So we, we respond in at least a pair so that we have one person can document the scene with photographs while the other person can take notes and collect evidence. But it's also good to get multiple sets of eyes in the scene so that we're not overlooking something or potentially missing evidence. And uh, for this particular case on March 29th, um, do you recall the area in which you responded? Yes, we responded to, it was a it was a dirt road, if I may refer to my notes. And did you generate a report as a I, result? I did. And would it help you to refresh your memory to refer to those notes? It would. All right, go ahead. Okay, so we responded to, it was Black Bottom Road, and it was near town Mount Zion, I believe it was, and I, I'm pretty sure we had to have the local investigators on the phone to kind of talk us how to get to it, because we, we weren't finding it. But we finally got there, and it was a, it was a, pretty soft dirt road, and then there was a farmer's access road with a wooded area near it. You said Mount Zion, could that have been New Zion? New, sorry, New Zion, yeah, that, that sounds right. I'm gonna hand you what's been marked as State 68 for identification, you take a look at that? Yes, sir. What do you recognize that to be? This is the diagram I made of Black Bottom Road and the farmer's access road. All right, and does that diagram, uh, that copy of that diagram fairly inaccurately depict the diagram that you created. It does. Now it's time to take 68. Okay. Submit it. Sorry. And Mr. Shank, excuse me, Lieutenant Shank, if you could just kind of hold that up. I apologize for not having a bigger version and describe what it is that that diagram depicts. So this area here, it says Black Bottom Road. It's the, the sandy dirt road. Right here, coming through it, you can see where there's a field. But coming right through here, this is the farmer's access road. And then these pins, I took GPS coordinates of things that we believe to be of evidentiary value on scene. Um, there were two cigarette butts. One was on Black Bottom Road. One was on the farmer's access road. There was a beer can bottle. It was one of those aluminum it wasn't a glass bottle beer can, but it was an aluminum bottle. And then there was a beer can near the, the footpath that we located. And the bottom one is where the victim was located. And did you take measurements in regard to those um, items or not? So when we take measurements of a crime scene, you use a fixed point in the scene that is easily recognizable. And we call it a reference point. That way you could go back and triangulate where the evidence was within the crime scene. But because it was mainly trees and there wasn't there was a couple light poles, but nothing I could really reach. So I used our handheld radios, give you a GPS coordinates that you can pin, and that's how I did this, was I actually collected GPS coordinates of each location of each item and then marked them on the diagram. All right. Thank you, sir. You can, you can put it down. You recall approximately what time of day you responded to that scene? So we got the call at 1620, which is 420 in the afternoon on 329 of 2019. Uh, we arrived on scene at approximately 603, and it was clear and about 75 degrees outside. 
you recall what other law enforcement personnel was there at the time, generally? There was, I believe the sheriff was out there, Sheriff Baxley, Investigator Huckabee from the uh, Clarendon County Sheriff's Office, and then I believe there's a DNR officer who was out there as well. And then there's a couple officers from the sheriff's office that were out holding scene security. What information did you have at that time as to what was there and what you were responding for? So pretty much the initial call came in is the sheriff's office located a, a found body in a wooded area, and that was pretty much the extent. I was told that there were some hunters that had located, her in the, or located the victim in the woods. Um, when we got on scene, there was we were informed that there were some beer cans and some cigarette butts that were kind of just laying out and around, so that was noted to us. But then other than that, it was it was we were told that we had a consent to search to search the property, but other than that, that was about all the information we had. When you get to a location like that, um, what are some of the protocols in place in terms of documenting or making sure that other individuals don't further, if necessary, if possible, contaminate the scene? Sure. So the sheriff's office in this case had put crime scene barrier tape up and they have law enforcement personnel there to secure the area, which is a plus. So we know that random folks from the area aren't walking through the crime scene because we know law enforcement have been securing it. But once we've met with the investigators and get our initial information, we'll then begin to take photographs of the scene as it exists. While that's going on, we'll actually pull all the investigators out of the way so we're not taking photos of law enforcement because we want to show the scene as it exists without us walking through it. All right. And when you arrive, can you describe, uh, I think this jury's pretty familiar at this point with Black Bottom Road being the dirt road and then the Farmer's Access Road. Could you describe where vehicles were parked upon your arrival? So there were vehicles parked on Black Bottom Road, and if I recall right, they were down the Farmer's Access Road as well. And some of those vehicles belonged to whom, do you know? I think they were law enforcement. I, I'm not sure who all the vehicles belonged to. All right. And so where did you begin with your investigation once you um, get out? What's the first thing you do when you get there? So the first thing we do is we, we meet with investigators to see if any more, because we all respond out of Columbia for sled crime scene. So sometimes when you get to the scene, if it's been a couple hours of a response, they'll have gathered more information. So. Our first thing to do is we meet with the investigators to see if anything has changed information-wise. Once we're done with that, then we set the camera up and start documenting the scene. Okay. Do you recall what you began to document first? So normally I like to start kind of, especially in a field like this, I don't want to start right at the victim. I want to start away and show the conditions of what was around her and what potential evidence may be around. So we started on, if I remember correctly, on Black Bottom Road documenting that dirt road to later go down the um, farmer's access road. Okay. You say documenting, you're taking photos. This is documenting with photographs or taking notes or, or and both. All right. Once you did that, what area of the crime scene did you move to next? So once we finished Black Bottom Road, we would then move down the farmer's access road to document the, the path down to where the victim was. And I believe there was a fire break uh, behind where she was and then we would document the actual footpath that we were able to use to get to the victim. And then we would eventually document the victim. All right, thank you. That states 146 through 165 for ID purposes only. If you could just describe generally uh, what those reference. These would be photographs of the initial scene as we um, as we arrived on scene. Okay. 
And um, Your Honor, may the witness step down from the. I'm sorry. I apologize. But those photographs fairly and accurately depict the scene as it appeared on March 29th. It does. All right, thank you. Your Honor, this time we offer states 146 through 165 into evidence. Yes. Alright, I'm going to hand you states 146 through 165 that have been admitted into evidence and ask you if you can describe to the jury what it is they're, they're looking at. And if you would refer to the particular item number as you're discussing the photo, please. This is State's Exhibit 165. This is a photograph looking down. So this crime scene barrier tape, this would be us standing on the uh, farmer's access road. And this would be looking down the fire break over the scene behind where the victim was located. State's Exhibit 163. This is a photograph of the beer can, that, or the beer can bottle that was located closer to Black Bottom Road than it was in the district. State's Exhibit 162. This is on Black Bottom Road, the dirt road, and this is marking a cigarette that we have used. So these flags were not on scene originally. What we do is, it's on TV, I'm sure you've seen the little placards that have the numbers on them. So instead of using that in kind of an open area or field, we'll use Evans flags. So it's a little bit easier to see from far off. So that's what that flag is, is that's marking the actual cigarette butt on Black Bottom Road. State's Exhibit 161. This is a flag in the bushes that would, is showing the location of the beer can bottle. So for reference to this, the victim is, me, the victim is further down in this area, and Black Bottom Road would be back over this way. State's Exhibit 160. This is another evidence flag that we used on the scene. This is Black Bottom Road, the sand here. This is the farmer's access road, the entrance to it from Black Bottom Road, and that is marking a second cigarette club with the flag. State's Exhibit 159. This is standing on Black Bottom Road, and this is documenting with a flag a little bit closer of the cigarette butt. And this photo also shows its relationship to the other cigarette butt on the farmer's access road. And if you go further up this way, that's the location. State's Exhibit 158. This is with my with the back, with your back to. Black Bottom Road, looking down the Farmer's Access Road, and you can see the crime scene barrier tape on the right side of the photograph, and that's the wooded area where the victim was located. State's Exhibit 157. This is further down the Farmer's Access Road, and the footpath that we enter is in this wooded area in the, up here. State's Exhibit 156. This is standing further down the farmer's access road, looking back towards Black Bottom. So Black Bottom Road is up here where the truck is, and the fire break trail would actually be right here, and the victim was in this area, in the woods here. 
States Exhibit 155. This is standing on the farmer's access road, looking at the path that we took to get to the victim. If you can see kind of where the brush has been pushed down, that's, that's how we gained access to where the victim was. States Exhibit 154. This is standing on the farmer's access road, looking at, or excuse me, standing on the other side of the farmer's access road, looking at the farmer's access road. The trail to get to the victim was in this area, and that's the fire break trail, which would put Black Bottom Road up over here. States Exhibit 153. This is going through down that access path in the woods. The victim is located up right about where my finger is in relation on the photo. And this is going to show where the beer can is. You can kind of see it in this photograph, but this is the beer can near the footpath. States Exhibit 152. Again, this is coming down the footpath. There's a bit better photo of the beer can. And then the victim you can see, start to see here, right here on the side. States Exhibit 151. This is actually a close-up, as best we could, of the beer can in the bush where it was located on the on the footpath. States Exhibit 150. This is on the footpath, looking at the looking down to where the victim would be found. The beer can would be over this way, and the victim is lying on the ground right up here. States Exhibit 149, this is on the footpath with your back to Black Bottom Road, looking down the farmer's access road here, and the victim was up around this brush over here. This is States Exhibit 148. This is, if you continue down that footpath, again, the bush with the beer can is here. And if you look closely, you can see the victim lying on the ground behind those bushes. States Exhibit 147. This is standing in the footpath, looking through the brush at the farmer's access road. And States Exhibit 146, this is actually of insect activity that we found on the victim. photos of, of the lay of the land, so to speak, as you're approaching down uh, the access road, can you see the body from the access road? From what I remember, I could not see the body until we went down that footpath. Okay. And once you went down the footpath and got towards um, the body, can you describe um, how she was oriented? Sure. So she was lying, I beg the court's indulgence one second. Actually, while you're trying to button one thing, show you <coughs> states 20 and 21. Describe those. This is the beer can bottle from the bushes near the dirt road, Black Bottom Road. And this is the beer can that was near the footpath. Uh, for stage 20 and 21 and then. I apologize for interrupting. If you need to refer to your notes, if you could describe Ms. Josephson the orientation of her body as you entered into the crime scene. So the victim was laying on her back with her left arm underneath her and her 
right arm, or near her left hip, or her, excuse me, her right hip. Her right arm, arm was laid over across her chest, near her left hip. Um, her clothes, we noticed that the bottoms of her, she was wearing some sandals, the sand, or like platform sandals, and they were broken, and her shirt was pulled up towards her head with a drawstring going past her head. All right, and um, what, if anything, did you observe about her in terms of evidence of some type of injury? So we noticed what appeared to be stab mark or stab wounds to her, some type of cut, um, and there was a large amount of blood on the victim, but there was wounds all over her. When you say on the victim, what do you mean by that? It appeared that in the skin you could see where she had been stabbed multiple times. Okay, and what parts of your body, of her body did you observe blood on her? So we observed suspected stab wounds on her head, her right shoulder, her right hand, her right leg, her neck, her back, and her right foot. When you, um, when you observe a scene quite like that, what is your first step in terms of addressing it from your standpoint? So the first thing I'd want to do, or I, we did in this case, is we wanted to identify was this something that happened here or was this something that happened somewhere else? So we know that there's a stabbing, so I, or we believe it's a stabbing. It doesn't look like gunshot wounds, so we're not looking for guns or cartridge cases. So we get, begin to search the area for knives or for blood other than on her to see if maybe she ran from whoever was attacking her. Um, so you kind of just look at what you have and try to figure out, did this happen here? Did it happen somewhere else? If it did happen here, what kind of evidence would I be looking for that would show it happened here? And if that evidence doesn't exist, it potentially happened somewhere else. So that's what we were trying to establish. Okay. And based on your observations at that time, did it appear as though the whatever act, whatever happened to her, did it appear to you whether that occurred on site or perhaps somewhere else? Based on where she was, how she was laying, different marks on her body, it did not appear that, and there was no blood around her. We looked on leaves and stuff to see if she was fighting, and, and we didn't see anything that told us that the scene had actually happened in the woods. We believed it happened somewhere else. All right. And any time someone has passed away um, in something like this, does a local coroner's office respond? Yes, sir. In this, in this case, the Clarendon County Coroner's Office responded. So do you work with them in terms of uh, logistics of what's going on with the body and how it can be moved and things like that? Yes, sir. So we work hand-in-hand -hand with the coroner's office. We will not actually physically manipulate or touch the body at all until the coroner's on scene and gives us permission. So we'll document the victim as she lays. Once the coroner gets on scene and we've gotten everything to work, we've picked up our evidence so that the, the transportation for the victim can come into the scene without manipulating or damaging any evidence. The coroner will come in, we'll work hand in hand and make sure that we can document the victim fully and then get the victim out of there. All right, excuse me one moment. Series of photos here that I'm going to hand up and ask you to take a look at. They are states, sorry for the number jumble 139, 144, 143, 141, 40, 38, 37, 42, and 106. Apologies for those random numbers, but here take a look at that and tell us generally what those are photos of. These are photographs that we took of the victim in her location. Do those photos fairly and accurately depict how she appeared on March the 29th, 2019? They do. All right, this time we'd offer the aforementioned uh, into evidence. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you. And Lieutenant Shank, if you could 
explain to the jury what their what those photos are. States Exhibit 106. This is a photograph, excuse me, this is a photograph showing the location of the victim on the ground in relation to the footpath and the farmer's access road. States Exhibit 42. This was the position of the victim as we found her, laying on her back with her arms going across her chest and her left arm underneath her back. And you can see how the drawstring and her shirt are pulled up and her shoes are broken. States Exhibit 37. This is a little bit closer to the torso of the victim. This is showing her left hand as it's underneath her back near her right hip. States Exhibit 38. This is showing the position of her arm. This is showing striations on her arm, the position of her shirt the blood on her stomach and the position of her hand. I want to stop you there for a second. Um, which number was that? This is States Exhibit 38. Okay. You used the word striations. Can you describe to the jury what that means? So if you look on her arm, you can see that there's blood and dirt mixed in on her arm. And they travel either from her elbow to her shoulder or her shoulder to her elbow. They, they go with the arm. And to me, that shows that something has come in contact with her arm to remove the mud and the blood from her arm. Is that consistent with being possibly being dragged? I would say so. States Exhibit 40. This is a bit closer of those striations. And you can see that the bug activity has started. States Exhibit 141. This is showing Black Bottom Road would be on this side of her. And if you look back up here on the photograph, you can see the trucks. The farmer's access road is running this way. And this is showing the open field that was behind the victim on it away from the farmer's access road. States Exhibit 143. This is a photograph of the bottom of the victim's foot. You can see that there's blood on her foot, and then you can see how her sandal has been broken and is no longer attached to her foot. It was attached by the strap on the ankle, but not by the toe strap. States Exhibit 144, this shows it a bit better. So she's got what appeared to be stab wounds in the right foot. You can see the suspected blood on the bottom of her feet. You can see how both of these sandals are broken here, but they're still attached around her ankles. States Exhibit 139. This is of the victim's back once we've rolled her over. And you can see more of the striations right around where her pants were. Thank you. What, if anything, did you observe about her, her um, fingernails? So her fingernails appeared to be broken or we weren't sure if they were broken or cut or how they were, but they, they did not appear to be like a normal way someone walks around with their fingernails every day. So speaking of, of nails, what, if anything, do you all do um, with the victim's body physically before the coroner takes the body to do whatever they're supposed to do with it? Sure. So once we've got permission from the coroner and we've finished documenting the victim, We'll then take fingernail scrapings from the victim to see if she had been in contact with anybody else to see if there's DNA underneath her fingernails. Um, we would take a buckle swab, which is kind of a big Q-tip that we stick in her mouth so that we have her known standard for DNA comparison. And we would also take fingerprints. So if anything shows up that we need to identify fingerprints on, we would have her fingerprints to go by. Okay. Can you tell the jury what a alternate light source is? Yes. So an alternate light source is it's a flashlight that has an alternate or a, a different wavelength than white light. If you've ever been to Chuck E. Cheese where they got the black light and your kid gets stamped with the 
old, old way of doing it. And that black light, imagine that kind of thing. It's a, it's a special flashlight that we use to look for uh, body fluids or blood or fibers on scene. And it's just a, it's an additional way to process the scene or document what's there. Did you utilize that in this case? We did. Tell the jury what you found. So we got once we got the victim up onto the stretcher, we utilized our alternate light source, ALS is what we call it for short, our ALS to document any bruises or injuries that the victim may have that you can't see with the naked eye. And that's what the ALS is good for, is, is bringing out bruises and injuries. And did you observe bruises throughout? The, from my memory, there was bruises on her sides and her arms and a good bit of her body she had bruises. Okay. At this point in the process, as you're uh, establishing the crime scene, you're beginning to collect evidence and the like on this particular day, did you know anything at this point about what had happened or even who the victim was? No. Um, it wasn't until, um, I think in my notes I say we had, it was right before, after the ALS in my notes I talk about it was when we found out or we were told who we thought she was, or who the investigators thought she was. But up until that point, we had no idea who she was or where she came from. And at that point, the information you were given, I believe, has already been testified to that um, it was a missing person out of Columbia, correct? That is correct. Later identified as Samantha Joseph. That, that is correct. What, if anything, did you observe about Ms. Josephson's ears or jewelry? So we did notice that her, I believe it was her left, one second. Yeah, no earring is observed in the victim's left ear, um, which sometimes earrings fall out. Maybe there was a fight and she lost it in the fight. So we actually ran a metal detector on scene to try to locate her, but we, we never located the earring. You used a metal detector? We did. Okay. Is that a common practice? It is. All right, thank you. And while you're doing this, you mentioned the uh, agent uh, Jasek, or what is her name now? Serencian. Serencian. Um, so she was there. Describe again what you all are doing in terms of how you're working together. So Special Agent Serencian would document the scene. So she, her, her whole job that night was to photograph and take photographs and to uh, assist with searching, but it was mainly documenting the photographs. And then my job would be make sure we're keeping up on notes, collecting things properly, and following protocols and procedures, and making sure everything flows so we're not missing anything. And so you've described for us um, what steps you took in terms of the crime scene and what you did with Ms. Josephson at that time, correct? And then so. ultimately she was removed from the scene, is that right? That's correct. Um, do you stay there after she's gone? In most of the time we do. Well, once the victim's removed, we search underneath the victim to make sure that there, there wasn't anything under her. Maybe there's evidence underneath where she was laying that we need to find. Um, and then we'll document where the victim was. And then once everything's kind of wrapped up with where we're at, we do a crime scene review or a walkthrough where we take the locals through the scene, tell them what we found, what we saw, what, how we documented things and kind of go from there. Okay. So once you completed all that, about what time was it? How long were you at this crime scene? We cleared that scene at approximately 049 hours on the 30th. So we were on scene from 6 the day before, 6 p.m. the day before till a little after midnight. And what do you do with the evidence that you collect from that scene, like the beer cans, for example? So once the beer cans are collected, they're secured in my vehicle, and we drive them back to the forensic laboratory where they're stored in an evidence room, and then we go from there, go home, and we'll come back the next day, and, or a couple days later, and log everything in. And... Okay. Did you ever respond back to New Zion again after you left there that evening? I did not. All right. But you had additional involvement in the case, correct? I did. Um, and tell us generally what that involves. So that night when we got back, we were told that there was a traffic stop conducted in Columbia and they requested for us to come document the vehicle that they had stopped. And where was that traffic stop and what time were you dispatched out there? The traffic stop occurred at 600 Saluda Avenue, I believe it was. Yeah, 600 Saluda Avenue in Columbia. 
we were contacted at 301 and we got on the scene at about 326 a.m. 326 a.m. Yes, sir. And that's Sal Saluda Avenue here in Columbia. That's correct. Okay. And um, do you recall the nature of why you were called there other than it being a traffic stop? So we were told that it was a vehicle that was possibly involved in the death investigation, Clarence. Did you notate what the conditions were like that night? We do when we respond to scenes. Um, it was approximately 57, 57 degrees Fahrenheit with clear conditions. 57 degrees, okay. And um, were you advised that some items of evidence had been taken off of the driver of the vehicle already? I was. Okay. And based on that, what did you do? So the, if I remember correctly, the contents were on a vehicle, so they were documented before we collected them. Okay. Do you recall what those items were? I believe they were, it was a cell phone, a cell phone. Um, there was a USB thumb drive, a set of keys, a plastic bag, a plastic bag containing an edible item. Um, there was also two do rags, another cell phone that I remember. Okay. And uh, Columbia Police Department was on scene, correct? They were. And they actually took some items into evidence themselves. Is that right? Yes, excuse me. The do rags and the cell phone. I actually got uh, a chain of custody from one of the officers. Yeah. So once that occurs, um, what's, your, what's your role next? So with that, we document the vehicle where it was, but given the nature of what we were seeing with the vehicle, we waited for a search warrant and for the vehicle to be towed to a more ideal location to process it. Okay. Did you take some photographs of the vehicle while it was out on Salute Avenue? We did. All right, what would be the purpose of that if you know that you are not going to be going inside the vehicle at that point until you get a search warrant? So whenever, even if we're going to tow the vehicle, we want to document the vehicle exactly how it was found when we got on the scene, what doors were open, what evidence may be sitting inside the vehicle that's easily seeable. That way, if anything gets shift or shifted around while it's towed, we have somewhat, or we have documentation of where things were in the vehicle. So it's standard practice to document before we ever move the vehicle. Photographs, but not rooting around in the car trying to pull evidence out yet. No, I do believe I swabbed a spot in the car, but that was the only thing I did inside the vehicle. Okay. Um, Your Honor, may we approach briefly? Yes. Thank you. All right, I'm going to show you what's been marked as stage 69 through 82 that council has seen already. You can describe what those photos are of just generally. These are photographs of the vehicle as it was at 600 Salute Avenue. Okay, and do those photos fairly and accurately depict the Vehicle has appeared on Saluda Avenue that night. They do. Your Honor, I will offer 69 through 82. I've created that. Thank you, Your Honor. Lieutenant, if you would uh, describe, I'm going to hand you these. Just a few here. All right. States 82. This is standing on the median of Saluda Avenue 
looking at the side of the passenger side of the vehicle. There's a cell phone on the hood, and then you can see the items on the roof. This is the trunk, documenting that the trunk was open, and you can see from here kind of what was in it. This is looking in the driver's door. You can see that the rear driver door was open, but this is the interior of the rear or the driver door. Okay. And when you're looking at the driver door of State 78, what if anything do you did you notice about the controls that were utilized with that vehicle? On this photograph, if you look closely, you can see there's a yellow light that kind of grabbed my attention. Um, Later found out that's the uh, driver door, or the child safety lock and the window safety lock. And it was engaged at the traffic stop. How did you know it was engaged? Because the light was on. And I'd later test it to see what happened when you turned it off. Okay, here's another stage 72. This is a closer photograph showing contents inside that little door handle and then the orange light on on the child safety locks. Okay. And let's talk about that for a minute. You said that you tested whether or not that uh, locking mechanism engaged. Can you describe what the child safety lock is and a window lock and what you did to see if it was functional? Sure. So the safety lock, it's you, when you have it engaged, whoever's sitting in the back cannot open the vehicle from the inside. The vehicle has to be open from the outside. Same with the windows. The windows can't be put up or down. And to test it, once we were done processing the vehicle later that day, um, I actually got into the vehicle to try to get out with it engaged. Then I had my partner turn it off to show that it did function, and I was able to get out of the vehicle. We closed it, re-engaged it, tried it again, and so we, we were trying to show that it actually did function as a child safety lock. And it did function that way? It did. So in other words, when that is engaged, what does that mean for the usability or the functionality of the windows and doors in the car? They cannot be used from the back seats. You can't open anything from, or close from the back seats. Do you have an opportunity to review an owner's manual of any kind pertaining to 2017 Chevy Impala? Not this one in particular, but in general? I have after the fact, yes. And what, if anything, did that tell you about this particular mechanism? It showed that the child safety lock and window lock were actually one button. Instead of on some other cars, you'll see them. It's an actual physical switch on the rear door. But this was actually just a, a button. All right. Thank you. State 73. This is showing a cell phone from inside the vehicle. Okay. Does it say what time? What type? It's an Alcatel. All right. And State 74. This is kind of a darker photo, but this is of the rear driver door. You can see suspected blood on the rear bottom of the door. When you say suspected blood, what do you mean by that? So we don't call blood blood unless we can physically prove it. So we have uh, chemical tests that we can do to show that it is presumptive positive for blood or it is likely to be blood with the test. But if I don't, if I have not tested it yet, I don't say this is in fact blood because I can't prove it. So I say it's suspected blood because based on my experience, it, it appears to be blood. All right, thank you. How is, uh, oh, I'm sorry, one other thing. I'm gonna show you states 70, 71, 75, 76. What is 76 showed overall? This is an overall photograph of the trunk of the vehicle and the contents. Why would it have been necessary to take that photo? The trunk was open, so I wanted to show what was in it. And then we were going to close the trunk to tow it because I don't want all the contents blowing out on a tow truck or on the road. So just to document what's where in the trunk. Okay. And you actually um, did secure at least one item from that trunk. Is that correct? I paid the course indulgence. Sure. Sorry, I'm jumping around. I'll hand you states 70, 71, and 75. 
Yes, sir. There was a black McDonald's visor in the back of the trunk. Can you uh, show that to the jury and describe what you uh, noted and observed about said visor? On State's Exhibit 75, it's kind of a darker photo, but it shows it's next to the white Yankee candle bag. It'd be further up over here. And then on State's Exhibit 70, there's suspected blood on the brim and on the, on the hat itself. And then on State's Exhibit 71, on the underside of the hat, there's suspected blood. What would be the reason for collecting that item prior to the test? It seems strange. It kind of stuck out right at me that it was a, there was a hat in the trunk. From what we were seeing with the vehicle, most of the blood appeared to be in the back seat of the vehicle. So the fact that there was a bloody item or a suspected bloody item like that in the trunk, it just kind of stood out to me. So I thought it'd be better to grab it now than let it get shifted around later or potentially damaged by towing with other items falling on it. Okay. Um, as was testified to you earlier, there were uh, several cell phones located in the car prior to your arrival. Is that correct? Yes, sir. I believe it was three cell phones. Is that right? That sounds right. Yes, sir. Okay. Did you collect those cell phones? I did not. And why not? Um, we had our computer crimes experts come out and deal with the cell phones. And do you recall which uh, agent from state law enforcement took possession of those phones? Lieutenant Britt Dove. Would you have had any other involvement with those items at that time? Other than photographing the phones, Britt Dove, or the lieutenant would have collected them. Okay. And, for example, States 77 depicts one of them, is that right? Correct. Okay. All right, so why do you have the vehicle towed back to another location rather than doing what you need to do right then and there? One... Columbia can be a busy town, so I don't like processing stuff in front of everybody and their, everyone to see. But two, it was dark outside, and if we can get it somewhere where we have better lighting to find the evidence, it's, to me, more advantageous to process it with better light. How's that uh, procedure work in terms of knowing that the car is not altered or affected in any way by way of the tow? So that's why we document beforehand, because as a tow truck, picks the car up to tow it, it may, items may be shifted around. So we document things as they go. And then we will um, usually ask the tow truck driver to wear gloves so that they're not adding DNA or anything to the vehicle if they have to get into it or whatnot. Sometimes they can just hook up and take it onto the tow truck. Um, but we do what we can to preserve the evidence as best as possible. And then someone follows it to maintain the chain of custody. And you collected some other items from the vehicle at that time as well, like the keys, correct? That is correct. States Exhibit 16, these are keys with a pink device on them, and States Exhibit 15, they're a set of keys with a kind of like lanyard type plastic thing on them. Right. And those are the keys that you collected? Those are. That, that scene? It's taken to, uh, excuse me, 17, or 715 Bluff Road, which was a CPD facility, or uh, Columbia Police Department facility. All right. What time did you leave the Salute Avenue scene? I left at approximately 0644 hours, so 644 a.m. Right. Did you go straight over to the Bluff Road location? I did. I got on scene at 0714 hours. Okay. 
And um, did you have an opportunity to revisit the Impala upon your arrival back at uh, Warford? First, I responded, I, I collected some items via chain of custody from Special Agent Jazik, and then brought stuff back to the forensic laboratory to log in, then responded back to actually process the vehicle. Okay, and what um, items did you collect from her? I got suspected blood from the suspect's shoe, swabs of uh, the suspect's fingernails, and then I logged, I, I took those back to the lab with, I believe, the known standard from the victim and then fingernail scrapings from the victim. Why would it be important to get those to the lab that quickly? So we wanted to see if the blood in the vehicle was in fact our victims to see if this this was the right vehicle that we were looking for. And until you deliver it elsewhere, nothing can be done with it, correct? Correct. All right. What'd you do after that? So then I responded back to uh, 7, 715 Bluff Road to begin processing the vehicle. And you mentioned that a search warrant had been obtained for the vehicle, is that right? That's correct. And um, so upon making it back to Bluff, um, what, are, what is your objective here with your car now that you're back in a secure location? So now that we have the vehicle in a secure location and we've got lights so we've got time, our job is to document as thoroughly and search as thoroughly as we can for any and all items that may be potential evidence. Can you describe where the car was and what the conditions were like? It was inside of a bay, like a big garage that CPD has, and it was well lit. Okay. And so do you immediately jump right in, or how does that process work? No. So first we meet with investigators, kind of make sure no information's changed in the last while since things have been going on and there's an investigation constantly moving. Um, so sometimes more information comes in of certain things to look for, or different things that we need to process. Once we've met with investigators, we'll review the search warrant, make sure the search warrant's a valid search warrant, and then we'll begin processing the vehicle. All right, so in this situation, um, what, jumping ahead, what, what if anything did you observe about the vehicle as you began processing? So there was, one of the first things we noticed was there was suspected blood on the rear passenger side rim of the vehicle, the outside of the vehicle. Um, the driver window was observed down, the rear driver window, or the rear driver window was observed to be about a quarter of the way down, and we could see what appeared to be um, some type of, it looked like footprints on the inside of the glass of the rear, pat, or the rear driver door. Can you describe why you thought that those might be footprints? Based on the shape. So um, your fingers, you've got, it's called uh, friction ridge skin, and you can, it's, it, you know, lane or it's got a movement to it and there's different things inside of it that you can identify folks with but so what we're looking for is we're looking for that type of skin to say it's a fingerprint or a, leg, or a footprint but then based on the shape of it you could see what appear to be toes as opposed to fingers so that's what made me think it was a footprint okay and so what do you do when you see uh, a marking like that so the first thing we do is we photograph anything and everything we do we photograph first and then we'll put scale tape on it, which is just a ruler that is tape, and we'll tape it so that we can actually have a dimension and an actual, have the photograph to scale. I'm gonna show you this Menard States 180 through 182. What are those? These are photographs of the latent impressions on the inside of the vehicle. And the uh, rulers on there with them? Yes, yeah, so those are the scales that we placed. Photographs fairly and accurately take. They, they do. Uh, they do. We got for stage 180 to 180. Okay. Thank you, Ron. Right. And can you just describe to the jury what that so this is the top of the window of the rear driver door. You can see what appears to be a footprint with the toes. This is my, this is the scale tape where it's got the ruler and the millimeters on one side, inches, millimeters. And then we mark what direction it is. So up the B pillar, which is the second pillar between the driver and the passenger door. 
and then my initials date, and then this was marker F. So we'll give each latent print a designation. And then over here, there's more that was latent E. And the other two? States Exhibit 181. This is showing the direction of the B pillar up. This is G, and in here you can see there's more friction ridge skin on the inside of the glass. States Exhibit 180. This, I believe, was after we rolled the window up. So the window was partially down. When we rolled the window up, we were able to see more impressions. And so that's what marker H was showing. At this point, it's not your job to try to do any analysis about the print, who it belongs to, or anything of that nature, correct? Correct. All right. Did you then have an opportunity to uh, examine the interior compartment of the vehicle? We did. And what were your observations once you got inside? We'll start with um, the driver compartment. So in the driver compartment, we, we saw a, a large amount of suspected blood. Um, we saw suspected blood on the seatbelt buckle receiver, the driver seat bottom closest to the driver door, the driver headrest, the, sh the driver seat shoulder area, um, the area between the driver seat and the center console, so on the side of the chair and suspected blood on the center console and roof on the, the headliner above the driver seat. When you see areas of sus suspected blood, what do you do with that? So most of the time we, um, or we always photograph them to show the location of them and then some of them will swab to collect, to have a sample of. How do you decide what to swab? In this case, we kind of went for larger areas to show what was, you know, a, a better sample. Okay. Um, and what other items were located as you made your way through the driver's compartment? So there was a wallet in the driver door pocket. Um, there was a social security card. There was a Wendy's receipt on the driver's floorboard dated 329 of 19 and time stamped at 1238 and there was an envelope in the center console that had suspected blood on it, and there was a handwritten list on the back side of the envelope. What did you do with those items? Uh, the Wendy's receipt was, I believe, collected, at least photographed, and the envelope was collected. All right. Got some more photos here. These are photographs of the interior of the vehicle and the contents within it. All right, it's time to offer 84 through 105 and 107, 108. Thank you, Ron. States 108, what does that depict? This is showing the driver's seat belt, uh, seat belt uh, receiver, and this is suspected blood on the seat. This is the driver's seat and suspected blood on the shoulders of the driver's seat. 104. This is the rear driver door. This is showing what the initial traffic stop photo, but a little bit better lit of suspected blood on the rear driver door. One. 
This is the front passenger seat showing suspected blood on the headrest and then something on the shoulder. 100. This is a closer up of the suspected blood on the front passenger seat headrest. Ninety-seven. This is another side showing the back of the front passenger seat headrest of suspected blood. Ninety-six and ninety-eight. Ninety-eight is showing an overall photograph of the rear passenger seat with this top job bleach container on the floorboard. And then this is a close-up of the top job bleach with suspected blood on the bottom of it. Along those same lines, 94 here. This is showing from, or this is, sorry, this is a better photo of it. This is this side of the seat showing the top job on the floorboard. Ninety-one through ninety-three. What do they depict? And what part of the car is that in? I'm sorry. I'm not... So these are all in the trunk, and this is showing a Yankee Candle bag that had suspected blood on it. This is showing a tan backpack, and here's the Yankee Candle bag again, showing some more blood on it, suspected blood. And then there was a bleach, some type of cleaning product with suspected blood on the container. You didn't have to, how are you approaching this? Like, are you doing the whole car at once? Are you doing the front, are you doing the back? We, because of the amount of evidence in this vehicle, we broke it down by compartment. So we did driver compartment, then rear driver, then, and we tried to quadrant the vehicle up, and quadrant the vehicle up, and then we would do the trunk layer. But try to break it down piece by piece. Okay, what did you observe in the um, rear compartment? So in the rear driver side compartment, we saw suspected blood on the interior door panel armrest, the interior door pocket, the seat bottom closest to the rear driver's side door, the interior door frame bottom, the seat back closest to the door, the seat belt, in the middle of the back seat, the rear, rear of the driver's seat itself, the rear frame of the driver's seat where the seat is attached to the vehicle, um, the roof liner on the driver's side, the light switch on the center of the roof liner, and the rear side center console, so on the side of the center console, and the air vents on the rear side of the center console. You take swabs from those items? Not all of them. We swabbed the middle back seat, the roof liner, the light switch, and the rear side center console. We saw pictures of the um, top job. Were there other um, cleaning products found in the car? There were, in on specifically that side, the rear um, driver's side, there was a clear plastic spray bottle labeled window cleaner with a blue liquid. There was a white plastic spray bottle labeled LA's Totally Awesome, or, and they both had suspected blood on them. Did you also find a um, container of lights in the car? We did, but I believe those were in the trunk. In the trunk. Okay. Are these the items you just described, the cleaning products and bottles that you found? Yes, sir. All right. All right, I'll offer 23 through 25 and 17. Have a great day. Have a great day. Thank you, Ron. You said that all but the, the white from the trunk, is that right? Uh, yes, sir. And the others were where? The window cleaner and the LA's Totally Awesome were in the rear driver compartment, and the top job were, was on the rear passenger side. What were your observations about the rear compartment in terms of the odor? So you could smell what we thought to be bleach. It, it was pretty pungent. And then when we picked up the floorboards, you could also see that there was they were wet and things were dripping off the bottom. Something was dripping off the bottom of the floor mats. 
something was dripping off the bottom of the mouth? It, like a clear liquid. Okay. And describe that odor again, please. It's, it smelled like bleach. Um, then did you find some gloves of any kind in the vehicle? We did. In the rear, dri or rear driver compartment, there was a blue plastic glove near the two spray bottles, and the glove was collected. And then two additional gloves located in the front passenger compartment? That's correct. They were in the interior door pocket of the front passenger door. States 27 and 28. I can have you take a look at those. Actually, if you turn that, yeah. Yes, sir, these are the gloves. Yes, sir, they are. Currently, Dr. 27 and 28. The previous objection. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, and so you continue to process the car. You, um, you're documenting, you're taking photos, you're swabbing, is that right? That's correct. Um, once you got to the rear compartment and the rear passenger seat compartment, uh, what stood out to you about that area as compared to the rest of the vehicle? Um, there was a child seat in that seat. There was also um, there was blood. The blood of the back seat. It, it looked compared to the rest of the vehicle, where you could kind of see where the blood was moving. It kind of looked like it was absorbed kind of into the seat or kind of diluted a little bit in the rear passenger seat. And how would you classify the amount of blood in the back seat based on your view of it? I can't give an exact amount, but I can say that there was a, a decent bloodletting, significant bloodletting in the back of the back of that vehicle. A significant bloodletting? Yes, sir. And that is based on your observations of that area of the vehicle? It, and throughout the vehicle. And throughout the vehicle. States 109 through 129. Is that the rear compartment photos? Yes, sir, they are. The dripping mat earlier. I'm going to show you states 128. Is that? That's it. In the photograph, it's there's. You can see a clear liquid beating up on the bottom of the mat in the view or in the photograph. 129. So this is suspected blood. This is kind of what you'd expect to see. There's, you know, things happening in the blood, movement where it's hitting. It's not, it doesn't appear to be wiped in that one. Can you elaborate on that? So it's, I mean, you can see movement in the blood where something has been in contact with it, but it's still kind of like there's a, appears to be a 90 degree mark where it's kind of hit the seat and stayed there. Um, it's not, it doesn't appear someone had attempted to clean that yet. One twenty nine. Yes, sir. One twenty six and one twenty seven. Actually, we'll just give you one twenty six, please. So this is looking at the back of the center console, and you can see the suspected blood inside of the air vents and down here in this compartment here. One twenty five. Um, How is that different from the other passenger rear passenger seat that you? So in this seat, you can see there's a red tint to it, but it doesn't seem like anything's going on with it other than there being a red tint. It just it didn't look right. Um, so that, that kind of just brought attention to it. And then States 119 is a little closer view of that. This is. You can see, again, the red tint, but there's no patterns. It doesn't appear that there's blood sitting on top of it like the other seats and everywhere else in the vehicle. 
120. So 120, this is one of the door jams of the vehicle. This is where the door seals here. This is the weatherproofing. And you can see the suspected blood inside the door jam. One seventeen. What do you observe about the seat? So this is the driver's seat, and you can see how there's blood flowing off of the or f moving. There's movement in the blood here on the back of the seat. And did you actually find a container for those vinyl gloves as well? I believe we did. Okay. States one sixteen. Sorry. Yes, and I want to say these were. In the front passenger interior door pocket, there was a black tag with the DG hardware of vinyl gloves, and that's what that is. All right. And lastly, 115. This is a photograph of the trunk showing the backpack, and there was a pink roll of duct tape in the backpack of the truck, or in the, in the trunk, excuse me. So it's a pink roll of duct tape? That's correct. States 29? Yes, sir. Is that the duct tape? Yes, sir. All right, we'll offer states 29. Thank you. Did you find any clothes in the back seat compartment? We did. What did you find? We found there was a leather jacket in the back seat, and there was a. Where passenger? There was a black jacket, and then, yep, I believe it was just a black jacket. Just a black jacket? Yes, sir. From the, from the back seat, just a black jacket. jacket, a Robert Comstock size XL from the rear passenger seat with suspected blood. Is that the black jacket that you retrieved from the back seat? This is. Your Honor, we offer states 22 and done. Thank you, Honor. Um, Lieutenant, can you uh, pull the bag out? Do you need some gloves? I've got some, sir. Okay. So there was suspected blood on the jacket when we collected it that night. When we got it back to the lab, we photographed clothing with uh, photographs. We documented with photographs. And we noticed some striations in the jacket itself um, that we documented with photographs and a scale to kind of show the size of what we found on the jacket. And again, striations being Something came in contact with the jacket that left a mark. Okay. Did you have, and you took photographs of that as well? We did. Can you point out the areas on the jacket? I know it'll be hard to see where you located those uh, possible striations. So one was down here, so in this circle area, you can see. I'm not sure if you can see it from where you're sitting, but there are some marks in the leather itself. Up on the right chest. There's that scratch or some some sort of something came in contact with that jacket on the right shoulder. 
and then down here on the right sleeve. testified about striations, you did so in reference to um, potential drag, things like that. You described the victim, how there were marks on her that showed that items were moved off of her, possibly consistent with being dragged. Is that the only manner in which striations can possibly appear on a person or an item of clothing? No, sir. Okay. Can you describe other scenarios in which that can occur? It's possible that if she was fighting, that if someone was wearing this jacket that claw mark or not claw marks but scratches from fingernails could cause those are those marks on that jacket consistent with that possibility i think so all right and briefly uh states 59 through 67 we're not going to go through all of these but just generally what are those pictures of these are the photographs we took of the jacket. Okay. And in your review of those photos, um, how, how does looking at that compare with the actual physical appearance of the jacket? I think you can see these better. In which um, Specifically, States Exhibit 60, you can see the, the striations on the front pocket, the front left pocket. Um, 61 is a close-up of it. 62 is of the right shoulder. 63 is of the right shoulder. 64 and 65, excuse me, 64 is of the arm. And so is 66. And 67 and 65 are suspected blood on the jacket. Suspected blood on the jacket as well? Yes. All right, thank you. Um, that was in the back seat of the vehicle? Yes, sir. Let's turn to the trunk. This is a pretty comprehensive uh, processing job that was taking place, correct? Yes, sir. Okay, and that's part of your training, right? Yes. All right. So in the trunk, you uh, found a, a bag with suspected blood, is that right? It was a Yankee, can a Yankee candle bag, yes, sir. Okay, 26. Bag. That is. Round it off for stage 26, the Yankee candle bag and evidence. Okay, okay. And I'm not going to ask you to take it out this time, but if you could just kind of describe what that is that's there on the outside of the bag. So this is suspected blood, and we saw what appeared to be some type of fingerprint or footprint impressions in the blood on the bag. So we collected it for our latent print department to process. All right, thank you. Do you have an opportunity to locate um, a set of flip-flops in the um, trunk of the car as well? We did. All right, and can you describe what they looked like? They were red and black Nike flip-flops. Um, then they had suspected blood on the left shoe. States 19 and 31. You would take a look.
Yes, sir. These are both flip flops. Without further ado, please. 19 and 31 in there. To the judge, do you want them out? Oh, I'm sorry. So this is the left shoe. And this is the right, right shoe. And you indicated that on the left one there was suspected blood on that, is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. And earlier you discussed the visor. We saw photographs of the visor that was collected. Section 34. Do you want me to open? You can open it and take a look at it. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. You can just tell us if that is in fact the visor. Yes, sir, this is the visor I collected. Your Honor, it's time we offer stage 34 and yes. Submitted over objection. Right. If you would show me here, please. So this is the black McDonald's hat that we've located in the trunk. As you can see, the suspected blood on the front and back, top and bottom. That is correct. And that was April the 2nd, is that right? Yes, sir, that sounds right. Or, or, I'm sorry. Yes, that's right, April the 2nd. What did you do with the vehicle on April the 2nd? Page 11 of your report. Yes. On April 2nd, we responded back to 1715, or excuse me, 715 Bluff Road. Um, and we processed it by, we, I pulled out the rear seat of the vehicle to gain access to the trunk to see if an emergency release of the trunk would work. Um, it did pr function properly. Um, I also took out the back seat and to document the suspected blood that had fallen through the seat belt and that had gathered underneath on the metal frame of the vehicle. And um, what did you observe in terms of suspected blood in the back seat? Once we took it off, you could see the suspected blood on the, on the base, but we also cut into the seat to show how the blood had gone from the fabric and soaked down into the foam of the seat. I'm going to show you what's been marked states 167 through 169. Do those photos fairly and accurately depict what you just described? Yes, sir, they do. Your Honor, the officer states 167 through 169. There are previous objections. They're admitted. Thank you, Your Honor. What are we looking at in 167? In 167, this is with the rear passenger seat, or the rear seat taken out of the vehicle, and you can see the suspected blood that had gathered around the seat belt latches. This is a closer up photo of the suspected blood on the seatbelt latches. All right, and can you describe the nature of that blood in any way? Like how it's, or no? I'm not sure what you're, sorry. That's all right, I'll, I'll move on. 167. So this was, as I was cutting the seat, I was trying to show the saturation from the fabric down into the foam of the seat. That's actually with the, the part that we actually sit on is cut open, and that's kind of the interior, interior of that actual seat? That is correct. And it's been removed from the vehicle in that photo? That is correct. All right. Thank you. All right. And then um, you had 
Well, a couple other items that she found in the vehicle at that time. A couple more pieces of clothing, correct? Yes, sir. Say 32, 33, and 35. That one. I think this was collected the night before. Okay. On the 30th. That's all right. Um, and this is a white jacket from the rear driver's. Okay. And um, 32 and 35. Okay. Okay. This was a white and color shirt with suspected blood from the floorboard of the front passenger seat. Thirty-five is a white and blue jersey front with I believe that was from the trunk. These, these bags all have some handwriting and, and initials on them. Are those your initials? That is. And you put those on there when you seal these items up? When well before I even seal it, I document on the bag what it is, time and date of collection, and then seal it up. Your Honor, this time it offers states 32, 33, and 35 minutes. All right, if you would open states 32 there, show the jury that I can describe what it is. white and color shirt with suspected blood from the floorboard of the front passenger seat of the Impala. All right. She would show the jury. All right. Thank you. from the rear driver's seat of the Chevy Impala with suspected blood. starts to turn like this. Sometimes it'll even get a little green like you can see down in here. Almost done. Um, and as indicated, you went back out there another occasion with the vehicle. This was all done. The most recent one we discussed was April the uh, 2nd, but then you, you returned to the vehicle on April the 29th. Is that correct? Yes, sir, the 29th. And that would be some month after this all occurred? That's correct. All right. Why did you go back there a month later to the vehicle? Um, we brought with us a um, trace expert to help look into the vehicle for his purposes. What is trace? Uh, our trace department, they are a, they deal with fire debris or GSR kits or different types of kind of microscopic type evidence. Okay. And so what was the pur purpose of bringing 
uh, this individual to look at the car? So that we could document the vehicle and collect cuttings from where we believed different chemicals were used inside the vehicle. All right, and so that would be for um, other analysts to uh, do examinations on at a later time? That's correct. Okay, and what types of um, testing does, who was the individual that was there with you? It was uh, Michael Moskal, Special Agent Michael Moskal. He's a sled agent? He's a class three officer, but yes, he's a sled agent. All right, and so what, generally, what types of things does he run tests for? Um, well, I'll, I'll just back that up, I'm sorry. To you know, what was he looking for? My understanding is he was doing chemical tests with the bleach. Okay, to see what exactly it was uh, made of, right? Correct. And he would have done that in his own time and another day. Correct. You were just assisting and helping get it from the car for him. That's correct. I understand. Thank you. All right. Um, not going to have, have you go into great detail about these, but I'm going to have you look at them. <coughs> One very small group and then one big group all at once, okay? So we can get you down. All right, states 56. Can you describe what that is? This would have been the envelope of suspected blood that we collected from the center console of the vehicle. And that's the one that was notated having some sort of writing or list of some kind on, is that correct? That is correct. All right, thank you. And when you collected that, you um, passed it on for further examination? Yes. Okay. Um, all right, we're going to leave states 56 for ID purposes only. Fifty-eight, fifty-seven, fifty-five, fifty-four, forty-four, forty-three, fifty-three, fifty-six, fifty, forty-nine, forty-eight, forty-seven, forty-six, and forty-five. You've previously reviewed these items, have you not? Yes, sir. Okay. And each of these items that I mentioned are all items that you collected in this case, is that correct? That is correct. And then after collecting them, you submitted them into evidence, is that right? That is correct. And states 58 is dirt from the wheel well, is that right? That is correct. Okay. And states 57 is suspected hair? Yes. States 55 is more suspected hair, correct, on the Apollo? Yes. States 54, cigarette butts from Clarendon. That's correct. States 44 are a series of swabs, all under one item of evidence. States 44 are a series of swabs from inside the car, is that correct? Items 65 through 79, sled items 65 through 79? Yeah, that's us. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. States 43 is a hair from the victim's shirt, is that right? Yes, sir. 53 is buckle swabs from Ms. Josephson? That's correct. Okay. States 52 is swabs from um, where Mr. Rowland uh, was seated at law enforcement headquarters, is that right? I believe I got those through a chain of custody, but yes, sir. Okay, thank you. States 51 
is hair from the victim's pants, is that right? Yes, sir. Page 50 is hair from the jersey that was collected, the white jersey? Yes, sir. 49 is our swabs from inside this impala. Yep. 48 are latent prints lifted from the interior window of the vehicle. Yes, sir. 47 fingerprints from Ms. Josephson that you talked about from the crime scene planned. That's correct. Two more. 46 swabs of suspected blood from inside the vehicle. Yes, sir. And 45, again, are the nail scrapings and clippings from the victim in Clarendon County. Is that correct? Yes, I do believe some of those are from autopsy, too. And autopsy. Okay, thank you. Your Honor, this time the state would offer each of those aforementioned items into evidence with the exception of state. There were previous objection related to the items from the car. Will any of those, those items be subjected or subject to further <coughs> testimony regarding chain of custody issues? Thank you, Your Honor. I meant to bring that up. Um, Ms. Uh, the defense and the state have entered into a stipulation uh, regarding the chain of custody internally regarding those items. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. All right. They are admitted. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Honor. This is a note we found, or a, a type letter we found in the glove box of the vehicle from, uh, it was a notice to vi uh, vacate. Okay. Does that photo fairly and accurately depict how that note appeared when you collected it? It does. Offer states 170. Okay. States 30. You don't have to open that one. Yes, sir. These are some clippers from the rear seat floorboard. Rear seat floorboard of the Impala? Yes, sir. All right. Your Honor, I'd offer state 30. And lastly, state number 18. If you could describe what this is and where it was collected from, you might need some gloves for that. This is a black beanie, field grade was the company, and it said cold blooded. And this was from the trunk of the vehicle. It was a black beanie, beanie? Be or a uh, skull cap. Okay. Toboggan. That's not part of the hat. This is the hat, and it says cold blooded. And we did know that there was a hole in the back of it. You said that it says cold blooded? Yes, sir, cold blooded. <clears throat> and where was that located? This was uh, collected from the trunk of the vehicle. The Impala? Yes, sir. Lieutenant Shank, does that conclude the nature of your involvement in this case? Yes, sir. All right, thank you. That's all I have. Thank you.
With regard to the last exhibit, um, was there the meaning, was there any testimony concerning anything other than it, its existence? Thank you, Your Honor. May I, may I really engage the witness? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, item 18, the meaning that you from the trunk. That's what you just showed and described? Yes, sir. Yeah. Was, there any, was there any testimony regarding anything other than the existence of it? Uh, not at this time, sir. It would be marked for identification purposes at this time. Well, he did describe the hole in it. Yeah. Anything unusual about a hole in the cap, sir? Um, Sure. Sometimes holes exist here for people using it as a mask, so I do notate stuff like that. But as for, I mean, it is a hole in the back of the hat, is all I said. I do have another question for you. Um, was that item um, later examined by um, other analysts at the Sigma Enforcement It was. You can see the markings on the hat where our scientists would mark and they can explain that better than I can. And that would have been analyzed for any DNA evidence connected to said, uh, said B. I believe it was set for DNA. Subject to the stipulation regarding the internal chain of custody, uh, regarding the that the state would offer that item of evidence. It will be admitted for identification only at this time. Yes, sir. That particular wrong. exhibit. Yes, sir. I'd be marked for identification, but not admitted at this time. Yes, sir, marked. And just to be clear for the record, just put it back in the back. Please. Do you have the back? Oh, yes. Mark, thank you. So to be clear, Your Honor, that is a state 18 driver. 18? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, we will quit for the day. Thank you all very much for hanging in there. Uh, we're going to resume tomorrow morning at 9.30. Please do not discuss the case or allow anyone to discuss it with you or in your presence. Please do not uh, allow yourself to be exposed to any matters or information through media or otherwise concerning this case outside of the courtroom. Thank you. We'll see you tomorrow morning at 9.30. All right, uh, officer, you are, uh, you may step down or you are, will be subject to cross-examination in the morning, so you cannot discuss your testimony in any form or fashion with anyone in the interim. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We'll see you in the morning at 9.30. Thanks, sir. Any other matters before we leave for today with regard to the this, the lawyers here. No, sir. Nothing, Your Honor. All right, we're going to have some issues I'm going to address with the media, but other than that, court is adjourned for everyone else. Uh, I want the solicitor and defense counsel to stay. Give you this. Here's number two thirty-three, by the way.
Oh, is that the joke? Okay. Yeah. I need to. Uh, I understand that the um, camera producer or someone, technologist, wanted to address the court regarding something. Yes, sir. Mask down so I can hear you a little better. The camera to the right of the person in court. Yeah. The one up to the bench. Okay. I wanted to see about raising that a little bit. Maybe a foot and a half, bring something in just to raise it up. Okay, and for what purpose? Just to get better angles. Um, it, it gets blocked. Okay. You mean one of the cameras in. Yeah, when the monitor comes out, it, I have to spin it to get the width. And, and the camera shows who? What does it show? Oh, okay. All right. So Yes. Okay. I'm, I'm glad I asked you before I informed you of these of this order. But yes, you can raise it to suit your to see folks better. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. All right. Thank you. Uh, other than that, I've prepared an order regarding media coverage of the court proceedings. Uh, of course, I've already authorized uh, media coverage, um, but I've prepared an order to sort of make clear what can be recorded and what can't. Um, I have some concerns regarding any type of photography and recording when court is not in session, when we're not in the actual trial, but uh, during the uh, breaks or during times when the jury is not in, uh, it, you know, um, lawyers can be doing some preparation. Um, many things <laughs> occur outside of the presence of the jury and matters occurring outside of the presence of the jury, um, uh, there should be no audio of those things, those conferences, and um, and just the courtroom in general, and um, and some other limitations regarding video when the judge is not on the bench and the court is not in process. And uh, I did address the movement of the camera. I said video cameras which were installed before the beginning of the trial may not be moved from their fixed positions. So you've gotten in under the wire on that one. Uh, so that's why I'm glad I addressed you first. And I have a copy of these uh, of this order that I've signed. About seven or eight copies for the media to have and one for the um, solicitor or the clerk. And, for the one for the clerk and one for um, the state and one for the defense and for the media folks who were 
who need to have one. And with that, I think we're done for the day. It also addresses prompt leaving of a court after court's over, uh, because after court's over, we sometimes have to return to the bench and do some other things in the courtroom. And when court's over, we need the media to leave. Thank you all. Uh, thank you all.